choose to worship with us this morning. We would love to connect with you. Please text WELCOME to the number 720. Welcome to Calvary Community. Here's what's coming up. Our Awana Club will be hosting their annual awards night on Wednesday, April 24th at 6.30 p.m. Come see all that the kids worked on this year in Awana. On Friday, April 26th at 7 p.m., we will host Steve Green live in concert. Come hear him sing. Tickets for our church are $10 per seat. However, seating... everybody here this Sunday morning, the Sunday morning after Easter. Last week was a great week. Just what, what a wonderful week. We had a great turnout, um, gave the gospel to so many people. I was back with the kids, and we had a ton of kids and their parents back there with us, and it was such a great time with them. And we, we had fun working with them, had fun playing with them, and then even doing the Easter egg afterwards, we, we got to give the gospel to all of them. And so now we pray for all that happens afterwards as people make decisions. We pray that people will come back and visit our church uh, and continue coming to our church. We do have a couple of reminders, things we want you to know is coming up. Uh, Awana is in their last month. So that last Wednesday night will be the Awana Awards Night. We get to see all the hard work that they've been doing Wednesday nights. They come in Wednesday nights at 6.30, and they memorize verses, and they play games, and we go through a council time where they, they learn about the verse that they've been uh, memorizing, and they say so many verses of the course of their book, and our clubbers have been working really, really hard this year, and so we want to invite you to come out and join us that Wednesday night at 6.30 on the 24th so that you can see and, and cheer them on with all that they've done this year as they get their awards. Then Steve Green is coming up. We've been saying a lot about him, but we want you just to be aware. Uh, Friday, April 26th at 7 p.m., uh, he will be performing live here. Uh, it'll be in the gym. And so if you have not already, if you know you're coming and you have not already picked up your kit to your tickets. Be sure to pick up your tickets. Um, you can go online to ccbcministries.org, our, our community portal, or they are available out at the welcome desk as well uh, after the morning service. And be sure to get your tickets as soon as you can uh, as seats will start selling out here soon. Um, if this is your first time, we are honored that you would choose to worship with us this morning. We hope this service will be a help and a blessing to you this morning, and we would love to connect with you. If you would, text WELCOME to the number that's on the screen behind me, or we do have a card at the Welcome Desk that you can get and, and fill out. We also want to get a gift to you, so if you either text WELCOME or fill out that card and get it to pastor, get it to somebody at the Welcome Desk, or get it to one of our greeters, 
we have a gift that we want to give to you just to say thanks for uh, coming and being a part of our services. Uh, I hope and trust that this service will be a blessing to you. If there's anything that we can do to be a help, be sure to see one of us. Pastor will be at the door at the back on the way out. Be sure to say hi to him, and he wants to get to know you. Pastor? Well, good morning. Whoa. I'm so quiet and demure that they had to turn me up. Thank you, Rick. Hey, if this is your first time here, would you just slip your hand up? Any first timers here? Very good. This, this is Sarai's sister and brother-in-law. Miguel is sick today. Um, please pray for him. The Rikers are sick. Um, there was somebody else, and I'm sorry I've forgotten, but we are glad you're here this morning. Thank you for visiting with us. Our prayer is that our service will be a blessing to you. If I don't know you, I, I do know Barbara uh, she said, do you remember my name? And I'm like, ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't. And she's like, what's your wife's name? <laughs> I, I don't remember that one. What's that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to forget that one. Hopefully now I will not forget that. So I told her I wouldn't forget and I lied. Uh, I am sorry, but I'll try not to forget Barbara again. <laughs> Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, please pray for Donna Hughes. Uh, her mom is in the end stages of her life. Donna is in Pennsylvania right now um, helping out in that situation. Pray for Donna's dad. Um, and so it is just uh, one of those situations where um, she knows Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, and we're grateful for that, and that is a wonderful thing. But um, it's also difficult on this side when that separation happens. And I told Ron's Sunday school class this morning, it doesn't matter how old you are, when your mom or dad slips off into eternity, that's your parents, and it's a difficult thing. So please pray for Donna and her family this morning um, and those that are sick. We had 201 here last week, and I praise the Lord for that. You guys did such a great job of inviting people, and uh, we sure appreciate that. But... As you saw in the video this morning, the work's not over. Don't, don't let go of those people. Continue to invite them back. Um, wonderful time last week, and uh, you guys just did so well in passing out invitations and making sure people were here. Well, let's do that every week. Um, let's fill this place up every week, okay? Um, and so uh, we do have a, a couple of ladies that uh, we're going to meet with today that want to join our church. And we had one join last week, so those things are exciting. Uh, pray that more will get saved, uh, that we'll be able to baptize and disciple more. Pastor Aaron and Elizabeth are discipling every week um, several different young people. Uh, pray for our college students. Um, just had one last night um, say, hey, can you look over my doctrinal statement? Had to turn in a doctrinal statement. And uh, we went through that together. So please continue to pray uh, for those situations, if you would. Let's give our service over to the Lord, and we'll ask him to work in our service today. Father, we are so grateful to meet with you in a, in a way that you designed and planned, the thing that we call the church, the body of Jesus Christ. I pray that as we come together today, it won't be just about one person getting up and preaching, but it'll be about honoring and glorifying Jesus Christ and us fellowshipping in your name. Lord, also the preaching of your word, I pray that as we start a new series today, that you would work in it. For the people that were here last week that may not know you, that they would be compelled to come back, uh, that your house may be filled and that we could minister to them, that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We pray for Donna today and her family, and we pray especially for her mom. And if you are calling her home, Lord, we just pray for an easy homegoing Lord, if not, then would you give her healing and strength? I pray for the Rikers, for Miguel and others that are not feeling well today, that your healing hand would be placed upon them. Uh, we pray for little Zoe, the young girl that has cancer, that you would touch her body. We thank you for Logan and how well he's doing right now, and we pray that you'd keep him cancer-free. For Julius Lyons as well that um, is dealing with a, a cancer situation. Um, 
for Cindy Lord, who is recuperating after um, having chemotherapy. Lord, just so many that are dealt or dealing with cancer right now. We give you this service and ask you to, to work in it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. If you would, please stand with us as we sing some songs this morning and just worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You called me from the grave by name. You called me out of all my shame. I see the old has passed away. The new has come. Now I have resurrection power. Living on the inside, Jesus, you have given us freedom. No longer bound by sin and darkness. Living in the light of your goodness, you have given us freedom. Dressed in your royalty, your Holy Spirit lives in me. I see my past has been redeemed. The new has come. Now I have resurrection. For his sake, 
I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection that and may share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible i may attain the resurrection from the dead amen we're going to sing a new song this week if you know it feel free to sing along with us we're going to sing through the first verse in the chorus and then we'll come back and start it over join in with us
can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at my feet, I'll sing through the God, the battle belongs to you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join me in imitating, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say 
this morning to turn to the book of Galatians. As promised, we are starting a new series this morning, unless Pastor Aaron changed the title of it. I sent him my notes and said, here's the title, unless you come up with something better. It's Galatians and the prison epistles, or Grace and Suffering. Some of my fondest memories of college are this class. It was entitled Galatians and the Prison Epistles. It was a time in my life that I just needed to see the grace of God. I didn't need to see the prison side of things. And so, of course, they started with the book of Galatians and uh, was so grateful for what God taught me through that. It it is difficult for me sometimes to preach through it um, because it does bring back the memories of what I was going through, and but how God blessed. Hey, by the way, I want you to know, um, when I got to my office this morning, there was a message, and um, I get uh, my phone messages through email, so if I'm traveling or something, um, I still get phone calls that are left um, on my phone at my office. Um, 
And uh, I thought it was a business call. I almost didn't even click on it. I'm like, it's just some stupid business. But I clicked on it, and it was a father from New York. And he said, I want you to know that my daughter came to your church last Sunday. And he said, she mentioned how friendly the church was and how people uh, greeted her at our church. So thank you for reaching out to our guests. We do have guests here this morning. So don't just do it on Easter Sunday. Be gracious every Sunday. So here we go. We are going to look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 through 5 this morning. And we're going to look at a couple of other verses out of Galatians as well. So bear with me. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. According to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever, let it be so. Amen. I want to start out this morning with just a brief introduction to the book of Galatians. I, I know that <clears throat> when you start a new series and you're starting a new book, sometimes the background of the book, you go, oh. What do we even need to just get into the message? Why do we need to know it? Because context matters. Why was he writing to these people? Who were they? What were they involved in? All of that matters when we are studying a book of the Bible. So as we give the background, don't fall asleep on me, okay? Stay with me for a few moments, and then we'll get into the message. An introduction. First of all, we do see the description of the Apostle Paul given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is not Paul writing. This is the Holy Spirit writing through Paul. I do believe that God used the personalities and the backgrounds of the writers, uh, those that penned this, but remember that it is God who inspired them. This is God's word to us, given through men, as they were spoke to by the Holy Spirit. Paul says, an apostle of Jesus Christ, not by the will of man or by man, this is simply by Jesus Christ. Why does that matter? Well, remember, the qualifications to be an apostle are, they were, there are no apostles today, just so you understand. Why are there no apostles today? Because the qualifications we cannot meet. You had to see the risen Christ. You had to be taught by Christ personally. The Apostle Paul, he was not one of the disciples. How was he taught by Christ personally? Remember, there was a time that Paul was called out into the wilderness, we might even say desert, and was taught by Christ himself. This was supernatural. He is an apostle, not by the will of men, it wasn't men that called him into this leadership role that was greatly needed during the first century. As Christ has departed, the church is being established. God establishes this office, if you will, of apostleship. Paul said that he was the least of the apostles. Remember Paul's testimony of Paul. The things that I wish I didn't do, I do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. And he said, and I am the chief of all sinners. Now, I've said this before, and I mean it. He was able to say it because I wasn't born yet. If you ask my parents, out of their four children, which is the one that was always pushing the envelope? It was my sister Nikki, I swear to it. No, they would say it was definitely Robbie. It was definitely him. Always pushing the boundaries. Always wanting more. Never satisfied 
with where he was, never able to sit still, always going, always doing. Man, did it get me into a lot of trouble. And I, I, I've told the church this before as well. My father was a police officer, and when they wanted to interrogate somebody, it was my father who did it. Now, for my first 10, 12 years, I did not understand that. So lying to my father was never a good idea. He would do things like, okay, I'll show up tomorrow and ask your friends. Don't, don't, mm-hmm. why? Because I lied. My dad hated lying. Man, I was and am, outside of Jesus Christ, A wicked, vile, rotten, stinking sinner. Left to my own devices, I'm bad. And Paul was able to say, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I am the chief of all sinners. This was the man who held the coats while Stephen was being stoned and thought he was doing it for God. This is how messed up his thinking was. I say that to let you know that the overall theme to the book of Galatians is God's grace. Aren't you glad for that? Oh, it is so good. Here was a man that was a bad dude. He was bad. He was persecuting the church. If he were alive today, he'd be coming after us. Was not a good person. Yet the grace of God changed his life. So he's writing to the church in Galatia or the area, if you will, of Galatia. He's doing this by the will of God. My question for you today would simply be this, whose will are you living in? Paul says, I am doing this by the will of God himself. Whose will are you and I living in today? Am I following my own desires My own thoughts, my own pattern, this is what I think I should be doing, or am I following God's will? Am I actively pursuing the will of God in my life? When, where, why? When was it written, where was it written, and why was it written? It was written from Corinth. During Paul's third missionary journey, approximately somewhere between A.D. 58 and A.D. 60, it was to combat the false doctrine being preached by Judaizing missionaries that works had to be mixed with salvation in order to get to heaven. We would use the word fickle today, the Church of Galatia. They were fickle. They were taught the truth and they would accept the truth and then somebody else would come in and they would turn to that truth. Paul would again go back to them and they would go back to the way things were supposed to be. Somebody else would come in and they would go back and forth and they would, for lack of a better term, kind of waffle back and forth between truth and untruth. And they would accept untruth with the truth because it made them feel good. And I'll tell you this, that is exactly what religion does. Religion makes us feel good because then we are doing something and we think we deserve good things because of the works that we do. No, my friends, I am telling you this, that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection is shed blood upon the cross. There are no works required. And if you're counting on your works to get you to heaven, you are going to fall short. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, because we would brag, the Bible says. And wouldn't we? Look at what I've done to get myself into heaven. Pride. Paul was all about the grace of God. Why? Because that is what changed his life. And he had the understanding to say to the, these were not Hebrews, They were not even what we would necessarily call those that were not Jews. They weren't really necessarily just Gentiles. They were Gauls. The people in this city 
were barbarians that had invaded and are now established in Galatia. We would look at these people and say, that's someplace I do not want to go. Again, bad people, bloodthirsty. We, we would go, that's a little scary. That's kind of beyond me. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be around that sort of people. It's like, eh, kind of above them. I'm a little too good for them. It's not how Paul saw it. Paul remembered what he was before he was saved. So about 30 years after Christ has ascended, Paul writes this letter of grace that God affords to us to combat what the Judaizers were teaching to the Gauls. That works were required. In other words, things like circumcision, going to the temple, even how to pray. And so they are mixing works with grace. And Paul is like, no, 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 my friends. This is not correct teaching. And why are you leaving so quickly the truth that has been given to you? The overall theme is the grace of God. Grace includes God's goodwill towards us and his good work upon us. Peace implies all the inward comfort or outward prosperity, which is needful for us. Now, let me repeat this. Grace includes God's goodwill towards us and his good work upon us. He starts out with grace and peace be to you. Not just grace, but grace and peace. Peace implies all the inward comfort and outward prosperity, which is needful for us. I certainly don't think it is sinful if you want to play the lottery. Knock yourself out. I hope you win and you're a tither. Let's just put it out there, okay? I'm not selfish about it. We would use it properly. So if you win, let us know. We'll come knocking on your door asking for your tithe check that week. This prosperity that I just mentioned in the peace of God, this outward prosperity that is needful for us, okay, things that God has supplied for us that are needful, clothing, food, shelter. I think in the United States, the things that we have often thought are needful for us are really above and beyond what God has promised Eyes have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. But you say, wait a minute, what about the Holocaust? What about the Jews during the Holocaust? There have been times that his children have had to beg for bread. I want you to understand that the Old Testament passage that is speaking there in context is a general promise giving to all those followers of God, not a specific promise given to the nation of Israel that they would never suffer. Paul says, grace be to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we think that all the blessings we have being Americans are needful. But when you travel overseas... And you see the things that are truly needful, your idea of what peace is may change a little bit. When you go into a dump in Nicaragua and you see children walking over dead animals to find a plastic bottle to turn in, and 20 pounds of plastic gets you five bucks, I don't know if you've ever seen 20 pounds of plastic but it's a massive amount of plastic, and they get five bucks for it. When you go into the cemetery in Manila 
and see 12,000 homeless people living amongst the tombs and are able to live and even be joyful in the salvation they have in Jesus Christ. Your idea of the peace of God changes, right? That outward prosperity that we as Americans think is needful. In other words, I need large amounts of, I need large amounts of cash in order to be happy. I did not know this. The last time I spoke at Pensacola, I thanked the campus church for their giving to Tim on our behalf as his sending church. I said, I just want to thank you. And if any of you are ever interested in going over, please let me know. Well, I had a college student walk up to me. Uh, I was speaking after church to a group of men in their dorm. It was about 70 to 100 young men that I was preaching to. And one of them came up afterwards and he said, do you have a few minutes? I said, sure. He said, could we go over to the commons and talk? And I said, yeah, I I would be happy to. So we went over to the commons and he sat down and he said, I really would like to go with you. I said, well, the next time I'm going is in September and October. And uh, I know you'll be back in school then. I said, we could plan a special trip during the summer months, but it would be a little bit expensive. And he said, well money's really not an issue. I know what it's like to be a college student. And money is always an issue. And I said, well, it would probably cost because when I go over, I'm going over with a team and um, you, you would really have to pay for both of us. And again, he said, well, money's really not an issue. And I kind of went, this kid is just an idiot. What I didn't know and I found out later because I saw it online, millionaire 23-year-old gives up business to go to Christian college. The guy that was sitting across from me was a millionaire. And the article that was written, they quoted him as saying, money will never bring you happiness. And then he said this, is money helpful? He said, well, of course it is. It gets things done, but it has never brought me an ounce of happiness or peace. That only comes through Jesus Christ. So as Paul's writing here, he's not writing to the wealthy saying, because you have money, because you have wealth, fame, or power, as we do here in the United States, he's saying grace and peace. And only through those things can you experience the love of God. Paul's desire was for the church of Galatia to continue and to flourish. Not to walk backwards. Not to be backsliders. Not go back to things that would hinder their growth and their love for Jesus Christ. Why did the Judaizers want to add something to salvation? Because it put them in control. It gave them power. Did they truly believe it? Possibly. But they were truly believing in the wrong things. We understand that, that there are people that are of great faith, but put faith in the wrong things. Believing that if they fly a plane into a building and murder people, they're going to wake up in this heaven surrounded by great amount of pleasure. Were they people of faith? Of course they were. But faith in the wrong things. And Paul is writing to combat those wrong things that the church of Galatia is now embracing. If you look with me at verses 3 and 4 again, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father to whom be glory forever and ever. And we say amen. The gospel of grace is here revealed. God's will for salvation. God's desire for the church of Galatia is the same desire he has for us. 
that we know Jesus Christ personally. I can't make the decision for you. You can't make it for me. God loves us all individually. He loves us all distinctly. And when he died, he died distinctively for you. In other words, This God of heaven who created everything left the glories and splendors of heaven to shed his blood because of you and because of me. He says he died for our sins. This is God's grace revealed in Jesus Christ alone. We see God's will for salvation. We see the grace of God as the foundation for that. He tells us later on, for by grace are you saved. What is it that we put our faith in? Was the God of the Old Testament a just God, yes or no? Was it just, was it right, that the enemies of God be destroyed by the people of God? Was that right? Yes. What did God know about those people? That they would destroy the nation of Israel if they could. And if the children of Israel had obeyed back then, they would not have the troubles they have today. The grace of God is being revealed by a just God who always judges sin. But because he is gracious to us, he does not destroy us in his mercy, in his grace. The moment that we commit our first sin, he would be completely just to destroy us. That would be okay. There is nothing sinful or wrong in that. He is a holy God. He created us in his image. We marred, we destroyed that image when we chose to sin. And he is completely just to send us to the very pit of hell. But by grace. Oh, he's good. Sometimes we look at justice as a bad thing. Do you really think a loving God would send somebody to hell? No, but he allows us to choose it. I would that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. But we are sinners. He didn't create us to be sinners. He created us to be image bearers for him. We are the ones that marred the image. We are the ones that chose to sin. And in his grace, he sent the only one that could save us from our sins. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by the Word, and without the Word was not anything made that was made. In him was the light of the world. John talking about Jesus Christ, the creator of God, left heaven to die for us because Paul says he is gracious. He's good. Justice demands payment for sin. Somebody is going to pay for sin. Jesus Christ said, I will do it for you, and all you have to do is accept my payment. You can go all the way back to the Old Testament and the nation of Israel out in the wilderness. When they were disobedient to God and God started striking them with a disease. And what did he do? He put a serpent upon a pole. And he raised the pole up and said, all you have to do is look upon it and you will be prepared. Do you understand that there were people that refused to lift up their eyes and look on it and they were destroyed? How rebellious is that? How foolish is that? And you may be sitting there thinking, well, I would look up if the difference is between my life and death. I'm going to look on it. Well, my friends, I am telling you this morning, the difference between life and death is calling upon the name of Jesus Christ. 
Man is by nature evil. Don't believe the lies of the world that will say that inherently man is good. No, inherently man is evil. When Adam sinned, he passed down to every generation a sinful nature. Outside of God, we are wicked and vile. That is why there is murder. That is why there are rapes. That is why there are thieves. Because man is inherently wicked. And now what are we teaching children? that they're nothing more than evolved animals. Well, you teach somebody long enough that they're an animal, what are they going to do? They're going to act like one. And now we find ourselves in the mess that we're in because we've taught children there is no God and they're nothing more than animals. But then we expect them to act sweetly and innocently. They're not going to. Sin will be paid for. And death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Somebody's going to die because of your sin and my sin. Jesus died to take our place, to save us from an eternal damnation in hell. That is what he did. You can accept his death. Or you can pay for your sin by an eternal death separated from God in a place that was not intended for you, a place called hell. Somebody is going to pay for your sin. And by the grace of God, Jesus said, I will do it. And for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? The penalty of their sin. One day, even the presence of their sin. He has saved you from the power of sin. Do you, know, do you understand you no longer have to sin? Paul is giving us the outline of grace here in the book of Galatians. And he says, God's grace is bigger than your sin. Oh, that's good. Here we see the gospel of grace revealed, God's will for salvation. Grace as the foundation for that salvation and the divine initiative in salvation. Look at what verse 4 says again. Who gave himself for us. God initiated salvation through Jesus Christ. Who gave himself. (laughs) Do you get that nobody could kill him? They couldn't kill him. We're talking about the eternal God, the all-powerful God. Nobody could take his life. He had to lay it down. He had to give it. Have any of you ever heard of Hannah Cruz? She is on uh, like Instagram and Twitter. She is a Christian lady. She gives a, a joke of the day. And her joke one day was this, and it, it caught me because there's so much truth in the, joke, in the joke. Is Jesus the Lamb of God? Then did Mary have a little lamb? And I laughed at it first, but then I thought, yeah, she did. Here is the Lamb of God being born of a virgin dwelt among sinners, but never having sinned, who became sin for us, who laid down his life. When he said, it is finished, the Bible tells us that he gave up the ghost. He gave his life freely. They couldn't take it. He had to give it. That is his grace, I'm telling you. I'll be honest, I don't know that I would give up my life for an adulterer, for a murderer, for somebody who is wicked, that I deem as wicked. Now my daughter, my 17-year-old daughter, yeah, I believe I'd give up my life for her. Why? Because I don't see her the way I see a criminal, right? Right? But by the grace of God, I am that criminal. I am that adulterer. I am that murderer. 
What does God tell us about hate? What does he tell us about looking on a woman to lust after her? We are that murderer. We are that adulterer. Yet Jesus Christ freely gave his life for us. He's the one that initiated salvation. We didn't initiate it. In the Adamic covenant, thousands of years ago, he promised a Messiah. He's the one that initiated what we call salvation. Number two, the gospel of grace revealed God's will for salvation, grace is the foundation of it, and then the divine initiative of Jesus Christ in salvation. The last thing I want to look at is God's call to embrace this grace. If you go back to verse one now, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead. We see before time began that God had in his will the the apostle that we call Paul was going to be born. He was going to be born to become a Pharisee. People that we look at and say, oh, were they bad? And he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Some believe that he was in line to become the high priest even. Whew. This guy had power. And God said, oh, I have chosen him. Before the world began, I chose him. And on a road, as he was ready to persecute the church, he ran smack dab right into Jesus Christ. A light shone down from heaven and it blinded him. And a voice was heard, Paul or Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he responds with, who are you, Lord? Mm, What a question. And then it comes, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. This guy's responsible for the death of Christians. And Jesus Christ saves him and makes him an apostle. The writer of much of the New Testament wrote more more books of the Bible than any other person. Now, I understand it's all written by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit used him to pen more of these books than any other person. Why is that? Because of God's grace. Verse 6 says this, Church of Galatia, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and you're going to another gospel. What are you thinking? Why are you perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why are you being foolish in this? Here's this calling back again. God is giving the church of Galatia another opportunity to come back to the grace of God. Stop adding to it. What part of this are you guys not getting? How many times are you going to go back to those old things that put you in bondage? These works don't do you any good. You may say, wait a minute, pastor. The book of James says, show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. That is talking to the Christian about how he or she is supposed to live their life. It's not talking to the unsaved about how to get saved. Understand the context of what is being said here. You are perverting the gospel that is by the grace of God and it is beautiful and it is wonderful, yet you want to pervert it by adding your works to it? No. 
Come out from the world, be separate from those Judaizers that have perverted Jesus Christ. That is wicked, that is wrong. He says, I want you to respond to the call of grace that God has so freely given you over and over again. Stop it. In other words, live in the freedom that God's grace affords to you. Live in the freedom that God's grace affords you. I think sometimes we look at Scripture as a bunch of laws of don't, 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 and the weights that, that so easily hold us back. I had the privilege of speaking in the Cornerstone class this morning. And one of the ladies said, something you said kind of freed me from the legalism that I grew up in. And I went, praise God, the weights that so easily beset us. The preferences that we have that we think we have to hold on to and we've got to hold on to them tight and if people don't agree with me then they're wrong look at the way I dress and my music is better than theirs and my version is better than theirs and look at the Christian that I am and I just became a Judaizer didn't I mm. no the grace of God gives us freedom freedom, to live in him, to be more like him, to put off the weights that hold us back. It frees us from guilt and shame. I have never one time followed the will of God and went, oh, that is shameful. I pray that if I am ever arrested for my faith, that when they go to take that picture of me, you know, that mugshot, that I won't hang my head in shame, that I'll go, I did this for Christ. And if they want to persecute me for it, they're not persecuting me, they're persecuting him. They're, they're flying into the face of Christ himself, that I will hold my head up with honor because of whom I serve, not because of who I am, but because of who he is. Here is this call to live in the freedom of grace. Walking in God's will, aligning with God's purpose. What the grace of God allows us to do is resist the distortions of the gospel. He tells us in verse 6 and in verse 7, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. What is he saying here? I marvel that you're so soon removed um, from Christ unto another gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news. And he says... <laughs> Okay, it's really not good news. Verse 7, he makes it very clear. It's not another gospel. It's not good news. They've come to trouble you, to turn you away, to pervert the gospel. It is because of who God is and the grace that he has so wonderfully blessed us with that we know the truth. He goes on to say in verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we, pre we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let me tell you, there are angels from heaven that fell with Lucifer, that want to pervert, distort the gospel. They'll give pieces of the gospel, but then distort it. How do I know this? I've been in places like West Africa, 
where you go into a village and they'll tell you of Jesus Christ plus the works that they have done. They'll take their fetish worship, worship and they'll put it in with the gospel. And religions will come in and say, yes, that's good, but add this to it as well. And, and hey, that's good, and add this as well. Hey, this is th this Jesus Christ thing, you can keep that, but make sure you put this work in with it. And they gobble it up. Oh, that's great. So I can do something. And it can be dependent upon me. And they have perverted the gospel. And Paul says, they are accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. I'm telling you again. I have to tell you one more time. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we received, let him be accursed. What does grace allow us to do? to bear fruit for the cause of Jesus Christ. In verse 10, he says, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Jesus Christ put it this way in John chapter 12, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, he, him, will my father honor. Christ said this. You try to keep your life by doing things, you're going to lose it. But if you'll give your life over to the grace of God and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and then you continue to live that grace, and you have a life that is blessed upon this earth and for eternity to come. Unless a grain falls and it dies, it's the only way it can bear fruit unless we're willing to die to self and say, but by the grace of God, it's the only way I can live this life to please him. It's the only way I can do it. Because if I do it outside of that, it just leads to pride. It leads to death. It leads to agony. But by the grace of God, but by his grace, I can have freedom in this world and a joyful life in the world to come, which we call heaven. Do you know that there is going to be a heaven on earth? The Bible calls it New Jerusalem. The old heaven and the old earth have passed away, and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. A heaven on earth. New Jerusalem will descend down and hover upon this new earth where sin has never touched. The grace of God. If you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen to me. Don't leave this place today without knowing how you, know, you can know for sure that you have trusted in the grace of God for your salvation. Let us share with you what it means to be a Christian. I'll be standing at the back door. Pastor Aaron will be playing the piano. Listen, he would walk down from that piano to share Jesus Christ with you, and nobody will bat an eye if you go to him and say, I need to talk to you. I'll be standing at the door. My people would rather have me talk to you than greet them. And if they don't, then shame on them, okay? But they do, trust me. Every one of the members here would say, I would rather have our pastor sharing Jesus Christ than greeting me. You're not interrupting. You're not disturbing. We want to share Christ with you today and that grace that he has given to us and wants to give to you. If you're counting on another gospel to save you, a gospel of works, a gospel that is different than Jesus Christ 
leaving heaven, coming to this earth, living a sinful life, giving his life on that cross and rising again on the third day. If you're trusting in my works plus Jesus Christ, my friend, you are not on your way to heaven. That is a work salvation. And I read the verses and I'll say them again, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. You don't work for a gift. All you have to do is receive it. I cannot do anything to earn my salvation. It was what Jesus Christ did on that finished work on the cross. Please let us share Christ with you today. For the Christian, please understand, as Paul starts out this book, he is writing to a church that is not unlike our own. And if we think that we have anything to do with the success of this church, we are sadly mistaken. It is all by his grace that we get to fellowship together. And if people are being discipled, if people are getting saved, if they're being baptized, it's not us. It's not us. It's all him. And we need to advance his kingdom by his grace. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of starting a a new series in a book that is filled with how good you are. I pray that this series will be one that challenges us, that will allow us to grow in your grace. Lord, if there's somebody here that does not know Christ, I pray that they would stop us today and say, I need that that we would be able to take your word and show them what it means to be a Christian. Lord, for our church, I pray that it would never be about us, that it would always be about you. So we give you these things, asking once again that you do a work in our hearts and lives. And all God's people said, amen. amen. But by the grace of God, Justin. If you would, please stand with us as we close out our service this morning with a song. We sing it frequently. It's one of my favorites, Just As I Am. Yeah.
today, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week.